Well, I want to welcome all of you to the second annual Holy League Men's Conference. And the theme of this year's conference is Fatima 100 and the Spiritual Battle of Our Time. And it is a providential time for us to come together, I think. Brothers, I think you know, or you should know, that we're living in historic times for the church and for the whole world. And remember, it was not by chance that Pope Francis designated last year as the year of mercy in the church. He did that because of what was coming this year. Now, think about what we are observing in the span of just this one month of October. This month, we're observing the 100th anniversary of our Blessed Mother's final apparition at Fatima and the miracle of the sun. The miracle that confirmed Mary's message and heaven's warning to the world to turn away from sin, to turn back to God or to face the most dire consequences. This month, we're observing the 100th anniversary of Red October, the start of the communist revolution in Russia, the spread of organized militant atheism all over the world, which has claimed the lives of more than 90 million people in the last century. And this month, on Halloween, we're going to observe the 500th anniversary of the start of the Protestant schism, which fragmented the Christian world and introduced the hopeless doctrinal division and confusion that we live with to this day. Now, like the two previous popes, I don't believe that all this is coincidence, and I don't think that you should either. Some of you may recall that more than a century ago, on another October anniversary, Pope Leo XIII had a vision, a terrifying vision of Satan. And after that vision, he composed the great prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle, be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. When the devil appeared to Pope Leo, he made a boast. He boasted, 100 years and I'll destroy the church. 100 years and I'll destroy the church. Now, if our Lord had the promise that the gates of hell would never destroy his church, you can be sure it was because he knew the gates of hell were going to try. But if the devil had been given 100 years to do his worst, the question has always arisen, when did that 100 years begin? When did this century-long all-out assault on the church actually begin? Well, I don't know. Nobody knows. But if I had to bet on it, I'll give you my opinion for what it's worth. <laughs> and it's just my opinion. You can take it or leave it. But I believe that 100 years began in October of 1917. Is something coming? God only knows. But whatever may come, we know we have got to be ready, spiritually ready. And one thing is for sure, we need the mercy of God. Brothers, we're living in an age when Christianity is under worldwide attack. We see our holy faith being driven from the Eastern world by persecution and exile. And we see our faith being rejected in the Western world, in this part of the world, especially in this part of the country, by a new paganism. We live in a culture that is dominated by paganism. What is paganism? The essence of paganism is idolatry, and the worst, the most insidious form of idolatry is the worship of the self, the exaltation of the self over God. And with this, we're now seeing the rise of a new and aggressive form of militant atheism, which is spreading like wildfire in our college campuses all over this country, taking in more and more of our young people 
all the time. It truly is, as Pope Francis has said, an age of apostasy. In fact, Pope Francis, observing another 100th anniversary, speaking at a World War I memorial in Italy, said recently that he believes that the Third World War has already begun. The fuse has already been lit in the Islamic world. It is true to say that Christians are now once again the most persecuted minority in the world. So right now we know we've got a lot to think about and a lot to pray about. I recently met a young priest from Pakistan. and He was here as part of a tour group visiting the Marian shrines of North America. And he comes from a part of Pakistan where the terrorist group called the Taliban is growing in strength and in numbers. The church there is being viciously persecuted while the government turns a blind eye to it all. Many Christians have been murdered. Churches have been burned and bombed. Bishops and prominent lay people marked for assassination. Our Catholic brothers and sisters in that part of the world now live in fear. This young priest, Father Samuel is his name, asked for our prayers, and he told us that his parish was recently threatened by the Taliban. The threat was communicated by phone. The caller representing the Taliban said, First, we're going to burn your church. Then we're going to burn all of you. And they all knew they're not kidding. They mean exactly what they say. They intend to do just exactly what they say they will. Father Samuel said, still, we are at peace. We are joyful. We're ready to give our lives for Christ. And he said, not a single parishioner stopped coming to Sunday Masses because of the death threats. Brothers, I wonder how many of us would go back to church on Sunday knowing we could be killed for doing it. I wonder how many of us would be ready to imitate their example, their courage, their virtue. You know, I find it ironic that something we American Catholics take so pitifully for granted, it's our freedom to worship publicly. The Catholics in other parts of the world is a matter of life or death. Brothers, please don't think that what has happened in other countries can happen here. I tell you, it can and it will happen here unless we are vigilant. At the time of the American Revolution, great statesman Edmund Burke said, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. For far too long, too many of us, Catholic men, have been content, satisfied, and complacent to sit back and stand by idly and do nothing. Sit back and watch the pagan conquest of this country. And how many millions of Catholic men are there? Catholic husbands and fathers who have been content to sit back and watch not just the pagan conquest of our country, but the pagan conquest of their own homes, their own families, their own kids. And I'll tell you what, I get sick and tired of hearing Catholics say, there's nothing we can do. I tell you, that statement is an insult to God. That is a denial of God's power and God's grace. Please, don't ever say there is nothing I can do. There is a lot you can do. You can pray. You can fast. You can offer spiritual sacrifices to God our Father in heaven. You can pray the Holy Rosary. You can take part in Eucharistic adoration. You can pray the chaplet of the divine mercy. You can stand up, speak up, and rise up in charity to defend the cause of truth, the cause of Christ. There's a lot you can do. Jesus said, pray always and never lose heart. He said, nothing is impossible with God. Fellas, during this conference, we're going to challenge you. 
I've always heard it said that real men like a challenge. Well, this weekend, we're going to challenge you to answer the call that God has given to each and every one of you personally to be men of faith, prayer, and devotion. Not just good guys, not just nice guys. That of itself is not good enough in the sight of Almighty God. That of itself is not going to get anybody to heaven. I've known a lot of nice guys in my day who are living terribly, terribly immoral lives. No, for us, it's got to be more than that. It's got to go deeper than that. We are called to be holy men. Men who understand that we've been created by God and for God to be saints. One of the things that the church calls us to do during an event like this is get our priorities straight, hmm? to focus and refocus on the things that are truly most important in life. We've come from God, and we are going back to God. One of the things I'm going to call you to do is to focus, as we begin, on what we can call the fundamental facts of our existence. Four main points, and I'll leave you these points for meditation. First, we have been created for heaven, union with God, perfect eternal happiness in God's heavenly kingdom, and our lives, the whole of our lives, have got to be directed toward that end. That's what it's all about. That's the objective. That is the goal for us. Anything in your life, sin that is, that gets in the way of that has got to go. God wants it out of your life. Number two, God is all-powerful. Nothing is impossible with God. God is going to get you there as long as you are faithful. This is the foundation of the virtue of hope. Number three, God has a great love for you. No matter who you are, no matter what your life has been like up to this point, God still has a plan for your life that is going to end in eternal glory if only you will cooperate with the graces that God wants to give to you. God has a great love for you. This is the greatest reality of your life. And finally, God is always faithful, faithful to his promises. In the gospel, our Lord made 130 promises for those who believe, for those who are faithful. What does God promise above all else? Heaven. Heaven. What will heaven be like? The late Father Benedict Groeschel used to put it something like this, and I think it's a good way. He used to say, Heaven is the place where every good thing, every good thing you have ever known or needed and did not have, searched for and could not find, longed for and has eluded you, will be yours. We've come from God and we're going back to God. We live with the realization that only God can totally satisfy the desires of our hearts. Only God can give the kind of real, true, lasting peace and joy and happiness all of us are searching for. We know that material things cannot do that. Money cannot do that. Human relationships cannot do that. Sex cannot do that. Only God can do that. Life on earth is a journey, is a pilgrimage through a passing world. We've come from God, and we are going back to God. And brothers, these are the spiritual thoughts I will leave with you this evening as we begin this conference. God bless you. Thank you, James, for that warm welcome, and thank all of you fellas uh, uh, for that greeting. And uh, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father of light, from whom all good gifts come, send your Spirit into our lives with the power of a mighty wind, and by the flame of your wisdom, open the horizons of our minds. Loosen our tongues to sing your praise in words beyond the power of speech. 
For without your spirit, we can never raise our voices in words of peace or announce the truth that Jesus is Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, fellas, so those of you who are still uh, getting your breakfast and your coffee, um, we'll just, I'll just talk right over you. And I can make more noise than you can, I'll bet you. Okay, let's begin with the reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verses 1 through 6 and 17. Now, fellas, please try to follow this reading, because if you don't get this, you won't get the meaning of the Fatima message. All right? This is all important. Hmm? Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, verse 17. A great sign appeared in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was with child and wailed aloud in pain as she labored to give birth. Then another sign appeared in the sky. It was a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on its heads were seven diadems. Its tail swept a third of the stars from the sky and hurled them down to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman about to give birth to devour her child when it should be born. She gave birth to a son, a male child destined to rule all the nations with an iron rod. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. The woman herself fled into the desert where she had a place prepared for her by God. Then the dragon became angry with the woman, went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring those who keep God's commandments and bear witness to Jesus. The word of the Lord. Well, I was talking to Doug uh, last night before Mass, and we were kind of coordinating what our talks were going to be because, of course, at a conference like this, uh, we don't want to cover the same ground, right? We don't want to be repetitive, and because the theme of the conference is Fatima, uh, we wanted to be sure that, that one of us was going to speak about the actual events at Fatima in 1917. That's what I'm going to do this morning. And of course, when we talk about Fatima, we got to talk about our Blessed Mother. Hmm? Now, I, I understand that there are some brothers here today uh, who are not Catholic. And brothers, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We're delighted to have you with us. Uh, but uh, since uh, this is the case, I just think it would be good for us to have a little review in regard to what Catholics believe about Mary. Right? Now, let me say this first of all, right off the bat, right? It is important that we understand and let it be known that we Catholics don't worship Mary. Amen? Amen. We don't worship Mary. Mary is not God. She's a created being like we are. We worship God alone. The Holy Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We don't worship Mary. We honor Mary. Why do we honor Mary? It's very simple, right? We honor Mary simply because, precisely because her son honored her. We honor Mary because Jesus honored her. How do we know that? The fourth commandment is honor thy father and thy mother. We know the one that kept the Ten Commandments in the most perfect way was Jesus Christ himself. And by doing that, he left us an example to follow. Who would dare to say Jesus did not honor his mother and give her the most perfect honor a son could ever give? Hmm? Now, the Apostle St. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. When we honor Mary, we are imitating Christ. It's just as simple as that, right? God made something great happen in Mary. The greatest event in the history of the world, the incarnation, took place within her virginal womb. And that is something that God intends to be known and understood and honored. Mary's perfect humility, her perfect charity, her perfect obedience to the Father's will. Her eternal yes to God reversed the disobedience of even set in motion the events that would make the paschal mystery the mystery of our salvation a reality that is something god intends to be known and understood and honored 
Mary is the great woman of the Bible. She is the great woman of Revelation. She is, in Revelation chapter 12, the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She wears that crown of 12 stars because she is the queen of heaven. She is the queen and mother of all Christians, higher than angels and men. Mary stands with the moon under her feet. Why the moon? Why does the Bible give us the moon as the symbol for Mary? Simply because the moon is not the source of the light. You see, the moon gives no light of its own. The moon only reflects the light. That's exactly what Mary does. You see, the moon gives no light of its own. The moon only reflects the light of the sun. That's what Our Lady does. Mary is not the light. She reflects the light. She reflects the light of her son, Jesus Christ, the true light of the world. This is why we honor Mary the way that we do. Many other reasons, right? And, fellas, remember this. There is nothing hard to understand about the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Right? If you just think of it like this. Right? God determined to become man. God chose a mother for himself. God created his own mother. Did he not? If you could create your own mother... How would you make her? <laughs> I know, I would make my mother all beautiful, all pure, all holy, all immaculate. That's exactly what God did. Right? There's nothing hard to understand about Marian devotion. You know? Okay, that having been said, let me preface what I'm going to say about the messages from Our Lady of Fatima in this way. The apparitions of our Blessed Mother at Fatima... Portugal in 1917 fall out of the category of private revelation. Now remember, private revelations have no bearing on Catholic theology. They in no way form any part of what we call the deposit of our faith. That is, what we hold to be God's definitive revelation to humanity. No one is bound in conscience to believe in private revelations. We say that God's formal public revelation to humanity is ended with the death of the last apostle, the apostle St. John. But history makes it clear that God gives certain events of supernatural origin called private revelations to serve as reminders, warnings, wake-up calls, if you will. When the church approves a private revelation like Fatima, Lords, Knock, Guadalupe, and the like, the church is saying that such an event is of probable authenticity, worthy of belief. Quote, probable authenticity. That is as far as the church will go in approving a private revelation. But if a private revelation is approved by the church, it makes no good sense to ignore it, and it's foolish to deny it. So to sum it up, we can say this. Private revelations that are approved by the church do three things, basically. First, they serve as reminders of what God has already revealed to us. They reinforce, second, they reinforce the message of the gospel in sacred scripture. And third, most importantly of all, they should move us and inspire us and spur us on to action to put faith and prayer into action here and now to respond to a crisis in time. That's what the message of Fatima is about. Okay? Now, to try to cover an event of the magnitude of Fatima is a daunting task in the span of one hour. I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to move quickly. So, fellas, please try to stay with me. Hmm? All right? In October 1967... Pope Paul VI, to mark the 50th anniversary of the miracle of the sun, wrote an apostolic letter entitled Signum Monium. Signum Monium, that is Latin for the great sign. And by doing that, Pope Paul VI related in an official document of the church, Revelation chapter 12, with the miracle of the sun. The miracle witnessed by 70,000 people who saw the son of Peter spin in the sky, dance in the sky, then suddenly plunge down toward the earth. The miracle that confirmed Mary's message 
and heaven's warning to the world to turn away from sin and turn back to God or face the most dire consequences. In Revelation chapter 12, the huge red dragon, the serpent, the devil wages war on Mary's offspring. Who are they? Who are Mary's children? According to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says this. They are those who keep God's commandments and give witness to Jesus. Those who keep God's commandments and give witness to Jesus. So in Revelation chapter 12, Marian devotion is about as biblical as you can get. Amen? Okay. Now, the world has been through 100 years of intense warfare, sp spiritual warfare and actual warfare. Pope St. John Paul II called the messages of Our Lady of Fatima, quote, a summary of the entire 20th century. And what I want to do here is to examine and summarize for you the content, the gravity of the Fatima messages, some of which Our Lady called secrets, and put them in some perspective for you. What I'm going to do here is to present you with the facts. The message, the warning, the promise, and what our response has got to be. Now, in May of 1917, with World War I still raging and no end in sight, Pope Benedict XV began a worldwide novena to Our Lady for World Peace. Toward the end of that novena, on May the 13th, Our Lady appeared for the first time to three shepherd children in the Cova de Iria near Fatima, Portugal. Ten-year-old Lucia dos Santos and her two younger cousins, now saints, Francisco and Jacinta Marto. On May the 13th, Our Lady tells the children that they are going to be going to heaven, but they'll have to suffer much before they get there. Then she requests that they pray the rosary every day for the cause of world peace. She tells them to return to the cova on the 13th of every month until October. The children come back to the cova on June the 13th, 1917, Great feast day for Portugal, the feast day of Portugal's greatest saint, St. Anthony of Padua. At that time, Our Lady repeats her request to pray the rosary every day for the cause of world peace and the conversion of sinners. Second, she tells Lucia she will have to learn to do something that few peasant children can do in Portugal at that time. She will have to learn to read and write because she is going to become, destined to become, as it were, the secretary of the messages of Our Lady of Fatima. Then Our Lady reveals to the children a vision of her immaculate heart, her immaculate heart surrounded by a crown of thorns, which obviously symbolizes her mother's anguish over the state of the world and the loss of souls. Then comes July the 13th. The July apparitions are the most important and the most powerful of all the Fatima messages. They come in three parts. Dire warnings to the world and the promise of Our Lady's ultimate victory. Now, the first part of the July 13th apparition, the first secret, is the vision of hell. Our Lady appeared to the children. She opened her hands. And from her hands there emanated shafts of light which seemed to illuminate the ground beneath her. And here is Lucia's description of what happened next. Quote, The rays of light seemed to penetrate the earth, and we saw, as it were, a sea of fire. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened or burnished bronze floating about in the inferno, now raised into the air by the flames, together with great clouds of smoke, now falling back on every side like sparks in huge fires, amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. The demons could be distinguished by their terrifying and repellent likeness to frightful and unknown animals, black and transparent like burning coals. Terrified, and as if to plead for succor, we looked up at Our Lady, who said to us so kindly and so sadly, You have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. 
To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. End quote. The vision of hell. Why the vision of hell? It is precisely because hell is real and hell is forever. It's an unpleasant subject to talk about. Many priests don't even want to speak about it from the pulpit anymore. But the fact of the matter is that no figure of the Bible spoke as much or as often about the reality of eternal punishment, the reality of hell, as did our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is as much a part of the gospel as any other. Why the vision of hell? Because fear of hell at least can move some people to repentance. We say there's no forgiveness of sins without contrition, without repentance. You got to turn back to God. You got to repent. If you don't repent, motivated by love, then do it out of fear. That's all you got. Fear will do as long as you turn back, turn away from sin. Right? Uh, there is a reality TV show on cable, and it's called Scared Straight. Maybe you've seen it from time to time, right? And in this program, they bring together these teenagers who are constantly in trouble with the law. And I mean serious trouble. And they show these kids where they are headed. What's waiting for them if they don't change, right? And they let these kids spend the weekend in a state prison surrounded by the toughest, the meanest, the ugliest, the most obnoxious inmates they can find. These inmates, they get in these kids' faces and they rake them over the coals and put the fear of God into them. They scare these kids to death. And then they take these kids by themselves. They lock them up alone in a cell for a while. Let them think things over. No television, no smartphones, no internet. These kids don't know what to do. They're beside themselves. They're gone nuts, right? At the end of that weekend, most of those kids are ready to change. It's the same principle at work here with the vision of hell, right? The desired result is repentance. Then, after the vision of hell, Our Lady asks that the decade prayer be added to the rosary. Oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. And July the 13th, part two. The warning, the second secret. Our Lady foretells the end of World War I, but she tells the children that if people do not repent, turn back to God and do penance for their sins, if they do not heed the call to prayer, that there will come another war, a war far more terrible even than World War I during the reign of Pope Pius XI. Now, some people mistakenly believe that World War II began in Europe with the German invasion of Poland in 1939. It's not exactly true. World War II began in Asia, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1937 during the pontificate of Pope Pius XI. So there was a prophecy fulfilled. Hmm? Then there's another warning. Our Lady says, trouble will come to the world from Russia. Russia, she said, will spread evil teaching, grave and deadly errors provoking wars, upheavals, and persecutions of the church. Then, just three months later, there comes Red October, the rise of Lenin, the Bolshevik Revolution, a revolution driven by atheistic communism, inciting hatred, envy, and class warfare. Hmm? Ali said this, quote, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my immaculate heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. End quote. Uh, fellas, at this point, I'll ask you to consider Our Lady's use of the word annihilated. Hmm? 
Think of the actual definition of that term. According to Webster's Dictionary, the word annihilated means total destruction, to reduce to nothing, to cause to cease to exist. Now, during World War II, even in those countries where the heaviest fighting took place, even in those places that were the most heavily bombed, there was not a single country that could said to have been annihilated. So Our Lady was warning us, I believe, that if we don't turn back, change course, and alter the course of future events by our prayers and sacrifices, the worst could well be yet to come. But just as most Americans today no longer believe in the reality of hell, so also we can say that most Americans no longer believe or understand the inherent evil of communism. There was a recent uh, nationwide survey taken on college campuses across this country where they asked uh, students, young people, about their attitudes toward communism. The results were frightening. 50% of the students they interviewed on college campuses said that they could see communism as a viable alternative to a democratic form of government. More than 50% said that under certain circumstances, they would be willing to vote communists into power. Now, this is scary. The great Spanish philosopher George Santayana once said, those who fail to learn the lessons of history are condemned to repeat it. Karl Marx, the author, the father of communism, said, where communism begins, atheism begins. Where communism begins, atheism begins. Now, I want to take a couple minutes here and review for you the nature and the objectives of communism, the evil of communism. Here are the objectives of communism. Number one, by means of revolution, set up the totalitarian state in the place of God. Number two, the destruction of the Christian faith. Drive God out of the hearts and minds of the people by any means necessary. Objective number three, destroy or confiscate churches wherever possible. Set up a puppet church, a sham religion in its place. Kind of like the People's Patriotic Church of China. The result of this has been the killing or imprisonment of tens of thousands of bishops, priests, nuns, religious ministers who resisted. Number four, stamp out Christian education in schools, ban the teaching of God in religion, indoctrinate, brainwash young people with communist Marxist ideology that is materialist, secular, atheist, utilitarian, and amoral. Fifth, fifth objective. This is key. This may well be the most critical objective of communism. To introduce fatal errors in regard to the philosophy of man. The idea that the human person is not made in the image and likeness of God the creator with free will, an immortal soul, and an eternal destiny, but actually nothing more than the product of random evolution. No more, no better than an animal, an instrument, an object that exists primarily for the good of the state, the state which takes the place of God. And when the individual is no longer seen as useful or is seen as an enemy of the state, the individual can be eliminated. Under communism, basic human rights, individual legal rights are crushed. Millions of workers are forced to renounce their Christian faith in order to be given jobs and even make a living. Millions of Russian families experience the terror the dreaded knock on the door in the middle of the night and a visit from the secret police. Family members, loved ones are arrested without just cause, without due process, totally innocent. They are taken away 
many never seen or heard from again millions are executed outright and then millions of others millions of anonymous men and women suffer and die in a brutal inhuman system of labor camps scattered throughout Siberia called the Gulag objective number six the attack on the traditional family Karl Marx saw the traditional family, especially parental authority, as a source of rivalry and resistance to the absolute power of the state. Under communism, the institution of the family is denigrated and made subservient to the state. Children, children in the Soviet schools are taught to betray their own parents, hand them over to arrest and possibly imprisonment or death when they are overheard criticizing the government or secretly practicing their faith. In different parts of the old Soviet Union, there were statues put up, statues of a 13-year-old boy. His name was Pavlik Morozov. Pavlik Morozov's claim to fame was that he betrayed his own father. He informed on his own father, handed him over to death. The father was executed as an enemy of the state. And after that, another family member murdered Pavlik Morozov in retaliation. Pavlik Morozov became a martyr for the cause of communism. He became, as it were, the patron saint of the communist youth movement, the Komsomol. Starting in October 1917, communism spreads its horrors throughout the world. It does provoke the so-called wars of liberation everywhere. 110,000 young Americans die resisting communist aggression in Korea and Vietnam. Then, of course, there was the arms race, the threat of nuclear annihilation, the Cold War. And it seems to me the Cold War, although there might have been a hiatus for some years, is not over by any means. And let me say this to you, brothers, Anybody who believes that Russia has been truly, actually, spiritually, morally converted is delusional. Delusional. With the Russians, here's the rule. Don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. Actions speak louder than words. Hmm? They have not changed a bit, so it seems. For example, two years ago, the Russians invaded and annexed Crimea in Ukraine. One of the first things they did was to arrest and deport a number of Catholic priests, closed Catholic churches. To this day, Russian women have the highest rate of abortion in the world. The Russians, in fact, are now in the process of modernizing and upgrading their entire nuclear arsenal while they prop up the horrendous regime in North Korea. So after 50 years of communism in Russia, Eastern Europe, the Baltic States, the Balkans, China, North Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, Cuba, Central Africa, and elsewhere, more Christians are martyred than in all previous years of Christian history combined. A total, a total of 90 million people Worldwide. Pope Pius XI also condemned communism in his 1937 encyclical letter, Divini Redemptoris. He said this about the communist revolutions going on around the world at that time quote, As far as possible, every church and every monastery has been destroyed. Every vestige of the Christian religion has been eradicated, even though intimately linked with the rarest monuments of art and science. The fury of communism has not confined itself to the indiscriminate slaughter of bishops or of thousands of priests and religious of both sexes. It searches out above all those who have been devoting their lives to the working classes and the poor. But the majority of its victims have been laymen of all conditions and classes. Even up to the present moment, masses of them are slain almost daily for no other offense 
than the fact that they are good Christians or at least opposed to atheistic communism. This fearful destruction has been carried out with a hatred and a savage cruelty one could not believe possible in our age. End quote. Finally, July the 13th, 1917, the third secret. The third secret revealed to the world by Pope St. John Paul II on May the 13th, 2000. The third secret came in three parts. Three apocalyptic visions. The first part, a vision of an angel with a flaming sword, obviously a symbol of the punishment about to come upon the world. Here is how Lucia described him. Quote, At the left of Our Lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand flashing. It gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, Penance! 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 In his commentary on Fatima, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict XVI, wrote this, quote, The angel with a flaming sword on the left of the Mother of God recalls similar images in the book of Revelation. This represents the threat of judgment which looms over the whole world. Today, the prospect that the world might be reduced to ashes by a sea of fire no longer seems pure fantasy. Man himself, with his inventions, has forged the flaming sword, end quote. We think of this, of course, we can think of the looming conflict, the spread of nuclear weapons by North Korea. Hmm? It's a reality. Now, the second part of the third secret. To this day, gets the most attention and speculation and generates the most controversy. It is the vision, the apocalyptic vision of the people climbing the mountain. Here is Sister Lucia's description taken from the Vatican translation of her handwritten account. Quote, We saw in an immense light a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishops, priests, men and women religious going up a steep mountain at the top of which there was a big cross. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city half in ruins, and half trembling with halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on the way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. And in the same way, there died one after another the other bishops, priests, men and women religious and various lay people of different ranks and positions. End quote. In his theological commentary, Pope Benedict explained the symbols of the steep mountain in the great city. And brothers, I believe this is the key to understanding the third secret of Fatima. Quote, In the vision we can recognize the last century as a century of martyrs, a century of suffering and persecution for the church, a century of world wars, the many local wars which filled the last 50 years and have inflicted unprecedented forms of cruelty. In the scene of this vision, we see passing before us the witnesses of the faith decade by decade. Then, the third part of the third secret, the vision of the two angels sprinkling the blood of the martyrs. Sister Lucia's words, Beneath the two arms of the cross, there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs, and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. End quote. It is the church's via crucis. Now, in my opinion, the best commentary ever written on Fatima was written by Pope Benedict XVI. Now, Pope Benedict described the third secret of Fatima as the church's via crucis, the church's way of the cross, he said this. The church's path is thus described as a via crucis, as a journey through a time of violence, 
destruction and persecution. The history of an entire century can be seen represented in this image. Then, in his commentary, Pope Benedict related the third secret of Fatima to the assassination attempt on Pope St. John Paul II, which took place on May the 13th, 1981. Now, you may recall that on that fateful day, Pope St. John Paul II narrowly escaped death. He escaped death by a matter of millimeters. Pope St. John Paul had always attributed the miracle of his survival that day to the intercession of our Blessed Mother, Our Lady of Fatima. Hmm? He used to say, it was a mother's hand that deflected the assassin's bullet. Some of you may recall that after he had the surgery to remove the bullet that was so incredibly close to a vital organ, the doctors presented him with a spent bullet. Remember what Pope St. John Paul II had commanded to be done with the bullet? They placed a spent bullet in the crown of the International Pilgrim Virgin Statue of Our Lady of Fatima, where it remains to this day. Hmm? Now, at the end of the July 13th apparition, the children ask Our Lady to tell them who she is. And she identifies herself. She says, I am the Lady of the Rosary. And Our Lady told the children of the Rosary's power to bring about world peace, the conversion of sinners, the triumph of her immaculate heart. Now, remember that Mary's heart is an immaculate heart, but it is also a sorrowful heart precisely because it is a mother's heart. You know, everywhere that we go today, travel around the country, preaching missions and retreats, we meet the mothers, the grandmothers, the fathers, the grandfathers who agonize endlessly over what is happening to their families, who agonize over the fact that Family members, loved ones, sons, daughters, kids, and grandkids have abandoned the practice of the faith, left the church, and are living so often terribly, terribly immoral lives. They ask us what they should do. Our immediate response is pray always and never lose heart. Hmm? Oh, you would not believe how many parents we meet who are agonizing constantly over the wounds inflicted on their own families, the wounds inflicted by divorce, family breakup, addiction, drugs, alcohol. Fellas, are you aware of the fact that in the last three years, in just in, in less than three years, more than 80,000 Americans have died, most of them young Americans, from opioid-related drug overdoses. That is a lot of parents in mourning, a lot of families in mourning. Think of Our Lady's sorrow as she sees all of it from her place in heaven. This is why our Lord has sent her to be the prophetess of our time. It is because she has never ceased to be our most loving mother. And when a mother rushes to her children, it is because she knows her children are in danger. The world is in danger. The church is in danger. Families are in danger. Marriages are in danger. Souls are in danger. Mary's mother's love never fails. Her mother's love never grows cold. St. John Vianney, the curé of our patron saint of priests, used to say, quote, Our blessed mother will never rest until after the last judgment. Between now and then, she is far too busy with her children. And now, August the 13th, August the 13th, 1917, the children are not able to make their rendezvous with Our Lady because they are hijacked by the government administrator Arturo dos Santos. They are taken to the provincial capital at the city of Orem. There, they are severely interrogated and even threatened with death if they do not divulge what the lady has revealed to them and if they do not recant, repudiate their testimony. They are told they will literally be burned alive. 
the kids are told that they will be taken and thrown into a vat of boiling oil. Still, the children do not recant. They are ready to die. They spend the rest of that day and that night in jail. They are released the next morning because the administrator is afraid that an angry mob is forming outside of the courthouse. The children meet with Our Lady again on September the 13th. On September the 13th, the children present to Our Lady the prayers and petitions of the people of Fatima and those of the pilgrims that have come there from everywhere. And again, Our Lady repeats her request that they tell everyone, pray the rosary every day for the cause of world peace. Then comes October the 13th. The last day at Fatima. Now, before October the 13th, the children have made it known that Our Lady has said that she will give a sign, a sign from heaven on that day so that everyone can believe the truth of her message to them. The word gets around. 70,000 people converge on Fatima on October the 13th. With them, an army of reporters, secular reporters who have come there not to report on a miracle, not to report on a sign from heaven, but to report on what they think is going to be a fiasco, a hoax, a mockery. They think that on that day, they're going to have all the proof they need of the ignorance and superstition of these stupid Catholics who have allowed themselves to be led astray by three lying, delusional, brainwashed little kids. The reporters get the surprise of their lives. Now, October the 13th is an awful day weather-wise in Portugal, right? It has rained heavily all night and all morning long. The ground is saturated The people who have come there, many of them without umbrellas at least, have their clothes soaking wet. Hours go by, nothing happens, the tension begins to fill the air, but then suddenly the rain stops. The clouds open. The sky seems to open up, and the sun becomes visible, breaking through. The people see the sun begin to spin in the sky dance in the sky and then suddenly plunge down toward the earth. The people are terrified. People immediately begin to scream and drop to their knees and pray. They think it's the end of the world. Suddenly, the sun stops in its course, returns to its place in the sky. And the world has all the proof it needs, the sign that it needs, the great sign to prove the truth of the messages of Our Lady of Fatima. The world goes out to all the world. So brings an end to Our Lady's apparitions at Fatima. But Mary is not done yet. On December the 10th, 1925, Our Lady returns to Lucia. By this time, uh, Lucia has entered the convent of the Dorothean sisters in Ponte Vedra, Spain. As Our Lady foretold... Francisco and Jacinta died soon after the apparitions. Both of them die in the worldwide swine flu epidemic of 1918 through 1920. Francisco dies April the 4th, 1919. Jacinta dies February the 20th, 1920. And of course, uh, they were canonized on May the 13th, this past May the 13th by Pope Francis. Now, Our Lady comes back to Lucia. She shows Sister Lucia a vision of her immaculate heart, and she says this. Look, my daughter, at my heart, surrounded with thorns, with which ungrateful men pierce me at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. You, at least, try to console me and say that I promise to assist at the hour of death with all the graces necessary for salvation, all those who on the first Saturdays of five consecutive months shall confess their sins. Receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the Rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the 15 mysteries of the Rosary with the intention of making reparation to me. 
Now, there are many Catholics who still to this day don't know a whole lot about the five first Saturday devotions and what's involved. They think it's a laundry list. They can't remember it, so they don't want to be bothered. Brothers, let me tell you something. Time is not on our side in all this. We've got to get everybody on board with these devotions. Hmm? As I said before, future events are not set in stone. They can still be mitigated by the prayers and the sacrifices of God's holy people, and especially those who will answer Our Lady's requests. Here's what is involved. Again, in the five first Saturday devotions, there are four main parts, two conditions. Four main parts. First, go to confession either on the first Saturday itself or at least one week before or one week after the first Saturday itself. Second, receive Holy Communion on the first Saturday itself. Third, pray five decades of the rosary on the first Saturday itself. Fourth, to keep Our Lady company for 15 minutes while meditating on the mysteries of the rosary on the first Saturday itself. Hmm? Now, two conditions. This be done on five consecutive first Saturdays. Key word, consecutive. Second, with the intention of making reparation for the blasphemies and sins against her, sacred, her immaculate heart and the sacred heart of Jesus. That's what's involved. Hmm? Not hard to remember at all. So again, here are the conditions for the conversion of sinners, world peace, and the triumph of her immaculate heart. First, pray. Pray the rosary. Second, the communion of reparation on the five first Saturdays. And third, the consecration of Russia to Mary's Immaculate Heart done by the Pope in union with all the bishops of the world. In June 1929, Our Lady returns to Sister Lucia and tells her that the time has come for the Holy Father to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart. After an inexplicable 55-year delay, the consecration is finally made by Pope St. John Paul II on March the 25th, 1984. Now, people ask me, why? Why the 55-year delay? You know, there's only one honest answer I can give to that question. (laughs) I don't know. The church doesn't know. The world doesn't know. All we do know is that the consecration has been made. Hmm? Now, there's a lot of controversy these days over whether or not the act of consecration of Russia to Mary's Immaculate Heart has actually been made. Rest assured, brothers, surely it has been made. Sister Lucia, before her death, stated emphatically, that Our Lady had accepted the act of consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart performed by Pope St. John Paul II. Who would be in a better position to know that than Sister Lucia herself? Now, there's a story that I know, and this is not hearsay. Uh, I didn't get this secondhand. I heard this directly from the man involved who is now a priest. Now, back in the mid-'90s, Pope St. John Paul II was receiving a group of American seminarians in a papal audience at the Vatican. And uh, he was greeting the seminarians that were there, walking down the rope line, shaking their hands, walking down the rope line very quickly. And while he did so, one of the seminarians called out, Holy Father, when are you going to consecrate Russia to Mary's Immaculate Heart? Pope St. John Paul is moving very quickly down the line, but he hears this and he stops. And he turns around and he walks back, throws up his hands and says, How many times do you want me to do it? (laughs) Russia is consecrated, he says. Then he repeated it. Russia is consecrated. So, fellas, there you have it. Brothers, You know that we're living in a dangerous and unstable and uncertain world. We see the rise of international terrorism, the threat to world peace, militant Islamic fundamentalism, 
the spread of nuclear weapons now and the possession of nutcases like Kim Jong-un in North Korea. We see the spread of militant atheism, Marxist ideology coming back on strong, especially in our college campuses. We see the spiritual confusion, the moral chaos. The spiritual battle of our time is intense. It's reaching a crescendo. If you study church history, you will see some of Christianity's most decisive battles were fought and won, not so much with the sword, not only with the blood and sacrifices of Christian soldiers and sailors, but especially with the Holy Rosary. Some of Christianity's most decisive battles, battles like Lepanto, Malta, Vienna, La Rochelle, were fought and won especially with the Holy Rosary. In his great letter on the Holy Rosary, Rosarium Virginis Mariae, St. John Paul II said this, quote, The church has always attributed special power to this prayer, entrusting to the rosary the most difficult problems. At times when Christianity itself seemed under threat, its deliverance was attributed to the power of this prayer, and Our Lady of the Rosary was acclaimed as the one whose intercession brought salvation. Why should we not once more have recourse to the rosary with the same faith as those who have gone before us? The rosary retains all its efficacy. Therefore, I look to all of you, brothers and sisters of every state in life, to you Christian families, to you the sick and the elderly, and to you young people, confidently take up the rosary once again. Today, I willingly entrust to the power of this prayer, the cause of world peace, and the cause of the family. May this appeal of mine not go unanswered. End quote. See, fellas, we're in a battle. We're in the spiritual battle of our lives. And you know that when you're at war, you can't win unless you've got the right kind of weapons, Right? A lot of talk about assault weapons these days, right? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm a priest, but I own an assault weapon. You don't know it. You can't see it, but I'm carrying on my person right now my assault weapon, the only assault weapon I will ever need. I have got right here a high-capacity magazine and a 50-round clip. Here it is, guys. Right here. Here is the weapon to assault the gates of hell. The invincible weapon that comes to us directly from heaven through the hands of our blessed mother. The invincible weapon. Brothers, do you understand that at every moment we have access to one of the most powerful weapons on earth? Prayed by an army of holy souls. Humble souls. Hidden souls. Unknown souls. The souls that God raises up as he casts down the proud. History has proven time and time again. The rosary defeats tyrants it brings back sinners it turns back invasions it knocks down Berlin walls it keeps families together it brings peace to the heart and joy and consolation to the soul ask yourself what does the heavenly father refuse the virgin mother of his only begotten son nothing the saints believe that God will never refuse the prayers of our blessed mother because she never refused God anything he asked of her when she was on earth Not even her only son. No, the rosary does not appeal to the proud and it never will. Vain intellectuals reject it. Unbelievers scoff at it. Modernists hate it. What do we care? The rosary is the prayer of the most humble of God's children. The invincible weapon. Padre Pio, St. Pio Pietrocini used to call the rosary his weapon, the shield against Satan. These are our beads for battle. A few weeks ago, the church mourned the passing of one of her greatest defenders of the faith, Cardinal Carlo Caffara. Cardinal Caffara had stated that shortly before her death, he had written a personal letter to Sister Lucia, asking her for clarification about things that Our Lady had revealed at Fatima, and uh, he really was not expecting a reply. Sister Lucia was in her last days at that time. She was sick. But to Cardinal Kafar's great surprise, he received back a personal letter from Sister Lucia. And she said this, that Our Lady had indicated to her that the last battle, hell's final assault on the church and on humanity will be the attack on marriage and the family. 
So brothers, here we are. The time is here. The time is now. The battle is here. The battle is now. We know who's going to win in the end, right? I always say, I read the end of the book and we win. We've got to cooperate with that grace. The final end is never in doubt. Believe me, the final end is never in doubt. In one of the last interviews that she granted, St. Lucia said this. I'll leave you with this. Quote, the most holy virgin in these last times in which we live has given a new efficacy to the recitation of the Holy Rosary to such an extent that there is no problem no matter how difficult it is in the personal life of each one of us or of our families or even of peoples and of nations that cannot be solved with a rosary. With a holy rosary, we will save ourselves. We will console our Lord and obtain the salvation of many souls. So we pray again today. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to thee. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father of light, from whom all good gifts come, send your spirit into our lives with the power of a mighty wind, and by the flame of your wisdom, open the horizons of our minds. Listen our tongues to sing your praise in words beyond the power of speech. For without your spirit, we can never raise our voices in words of peace or announce the truth that Jesus is Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Mary, Mother of Mercy, St. Joseph, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'll ask you at this time to stand for a reading from the Gospel. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his apostles, Do not suppose that my mission on earth is to spread peace. My mission is to spread not peace, but division. I have come to set a man at odds with his father, a daughter with her mother, a daughter-in-law with her mother-in-law. In short, to make a man's enemies those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother, son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who will not take up his cross and come after me is not worthy of me. He who seeks only himself brings himself to ruin, whereas he who brings himself to naught for me discovers who he is. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, I have decided to join the NFL protests by taking the knee at benediction. Here is the one I will take the knee for, Mm -hmm. my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When I was a young priest, hadn't been ordained many years, uh, during the summer months, sometimes my religious superior would send me to fill in in a little parish in Alabama And across the street from the rectory, there was a supermarket. Um, It was called Piggly Wiggly. One afternoon, I went over to Piggly Wiggly to buy some groceries, and uh, there was a fellow there, a parishioner, recognized me. You can't miss a priest dressed in Roman collar in that part of Alabama. So he came over and introduced himself, and he said to me, Yeah, Father, I was in church on Sunday, and I want to tell you, you really give a good sermon. 
He said, I really like that sermon. I got a lot out of that. That lifted my spirits momentarily. And I said to him, well, what did I say that you like so much? And then he hesitated for a long time with a blank stare in his face. And he hemmed and he hawed. And finally he said, well, I don't remember any of it now, but it was real good. <laughs> you know, it is true to say that most of us tend to have uh, short memories. Right now it seems to me that most Americans have a really bad case of historical amnesia. A while back, I was watching a documentary about the Second World War, and they were interviewing some Marine veterans who fought in some of those bloody battles in the Pacific, battles like Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Peleliu, Saipan, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. And they were making the point that today, for most Americans, those names mean absolutely nothing. In fact, most younger Americans have never even heard of those places because the vast majority of Americans have long ago forgotten the horror of those battles and the terrible cost in human lives. In fact, they were interviewing some high school students about the Second World War, and a lot of the kids did not know which countries were fighting on which side. A lot of the kids thought we were fighting against the Russians, uh, some of them said they had heard things about this guy named Hitler. He's a really bad dude, but that was about all that they knew. This is a tragedy. Right? Abraham Lincoln once said, a nation that forgets its past has no future. I wonder sometimes, honestly, if we have any future. If we do have any future as a people and as a nation, it's going to be because of men like you here today. It is said that every priest brings a little of his own background into religious life with him, and certainly that's true in my case, for better or for worse. And because I came from a military background, I was an army officer before I became a priest, it is always easy for me to describe things uh, and understand things in military terms, stories and analogies and metaphors and the like. And I think that's entirely appropriate because when you read the sacred scriptures, and the writings of the early church fathers, the church documents, and the lives of the saints, you'll find that they are <clears throat> loaded with military terminology. Terms like war, battle, combat, weapons, enemies, strategies, tactics, victories, and defeats. The Bible uses the words war and battle more than 400 times. Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword, the sword meaning division. The gospel itself is called a two-edged sword. It cuts to the heart. It probes. It reveals what is hidden in the human heart. And we find the classic example of these kind of terminologies and writings, the writings of the apostle St. Paul, especially in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6. Starting in verse 11, St. Paul wrote this. <clears throat> Put on the armor of God and stand firm against the tactics of the devil. For our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers of this present darkness, with the evil spirits in the heavens. Therefore, put on the armor of God. Hold your ground. Stand fast. Hold faith as a shield. To stop the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Even St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, the gentlest of souls, used these kind of terms in her writings. For example, when she wrote about her impending death as God taking her from the battlefield of life. Pope Francis <clears throat> likes to compare the church to a battlefield hospital where the faithful come to be healed of the wounds of the spiritual battle of their lives. The late Father Benedict Rochelle used to say the spiritual life of its nature is a constant, lifelong, daily struggle. <clears throat> you see, the soldier wages war in the natural order. The Christian is intended by God to do battle in the supernatural order. All of us, each one of us, is called to be a soldier of Jesus Christ by virtue of our confirmation. Brothers, have we forgotten that? The gift of the Holy Spirit 
enables us and empowers us and obligates us to be defenders of the faith. <clears throat> and please don't ever think that kind of terminology is outdated. I assure you that it is not. Don't ever think that being a soldier for Christ is just a guy thing. Some of the greatest prayer warriors I've ever known have been the women. Some of these, uh, these women <laughs> prayer warriors, these little spiritual souls, put priests like me to shame, believe me. One of the greatest soldiers for Christ that I have known in my lifetime was Mother Angelica. Early on in my apostolic ministry, I was uh, privileged to know Mother Angelica, and she had me on her live show a few times. And I remember one time when uh, I was with her, she was in the middle of a running battle with a very influential cardinal archbishop whom she had criticized on the air. <clears throat> and he was coming back at her. And he was uh, garnering his allies among the bishops who were like-minded with him. And uh, they truly made an attempt to have her removed as the superior of her community and take the network away from her. Uh, she was ready for them. But they had her going for a time, and I know this for a fact. I know for a fact that she had gotten a threatening letter from a cardinal in the Roman Curia, a bureaucrat, who told her basically if she did not get in step with the bishops that uh, she would possibly be removed as the superior of her community. The mother was never going to let anybody wrest that network away from her. Hmm? I remember I said to her one time, Mother, um, I heard that you had said that before you let them take control of the network, you had burned it to the ground. <clears throat> and Mother said, no. No, I didn't say that. I said I'd blow the damn thing up. <laughs> that was Mother Angelica, huh? Pope St. John Paul II used to say that there's taking place today the greatest battle between good and evil that the world has ever known. Today, the church is fighting for her life in many places. The truth is under attack. Souls are hanging in the balance. The outcome is a matter of life or death. Nothing less than that. And, fellas, I think that the worst thing about this battle is that it seems like not one person in a hundred or even a thousand sometimes even seems to know that it's going on. The concept, the reality of spiritual warfare is the definitive teaching of the Catholic Church. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, section 409, under the heading, A Hard Battle, says this. The dramatic situation of the whole world, which is in the power of the evil one, makes life on earth a battle. The whole of man's history has been the story of dour combat with the powers of evil, stretching, so our Lord tells us, from the very dawn of history until the last day. Finding himself in the midst of the battlefield, man has to struggle to do what is right, and it is at great cost to himself and aided by God's grace that he succeeds in achieving his own inner integrity. End quote. You know, I've spent the better part of the last 25 years on the road, living out of my suitcase, preaching the gospel. And fellas, I'm sorry to tell you that everywhere we go today, and I mean everywhere, we're seeing the terrible effects of the great loss of faith in our time. And it seems like Every Catholic family has been wounded in some way in this great abandonment of faith in our day. Every family seems to have been wounded. I remember one time I was speaking at the St. Louis Marian Conference. This conference was held in this huge hotel ballroom, and it was a Saturday night. I get onto the subject. There were about 1,500 people there. And I said to everybody there, now raise a hand if you have a family member, a loved one, who has left the church and abandoned the practice of the faith. Guys, I'm not kidding you. I'm not exaggerating. I did not see a single adult who didn't raise a hand. That's how bad things are. It seems like every American family has been wounded in some way in this great abandonment of faith in our day. It seems like every family is wounded in one way or another. For example, wounded by addiction in one form or another. 
wounded by drugs or alcohol abuse or sexual abuse, wounded by pornography, poisoning souls and minds and marriages, more with every passing day, wounded by infidelity, bad marriages, family breakup and all the emotional and psychological devastation that goes with that, wounded by suicides, crime, violence, atheism or whatever. And I think at least all you guys here would have the good sense to realize we are now living at the time of a tragic, disastrous, spiritual and moral collapse that threatens the very life and future of this country. And if you don't believe that, then you are simply not a student of history or a scripture for that matter. You've got to be spiritually blind not to be able to see that there is going on all around us today the constant public attack on Christianity, the constant assault on Christian values and Christian morality, the relentless attack especially in the sanctity of marriage and human sexuality and human life. Things are not getting better, they're getting worse. Why is all this happening now? It's happening because, let's face it, we as a people have turned away from God. We've lost our sense of God. We have lost our sense of sin. And now we are reaping what we have sown for all these decades. As it says in Scripture, sow the wind, reap the whirlwind. Let me ask you something. What kind of a world do you think your kids and your grandkids are going to live in if we go on the way that we are? We go on the way that we have. St. John Vianney, the curé of R, the patron saint of priests, used to say, without God, without the true God, men will revert to barbarism in three generations. And I would suggest to you we are working on a third generation right now. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the barbarians are at the gates. No, if they would just stay at the gates, there would be no problem. They're coming into our homes. We're letting it happen. We're letting them in via the television and the Internet. Brothers, you know as well as I do that at some point in time, there's got to be a spiritual renewal in this country, and it's got to begin with us. There's only one way it can begin. You change the world by changing one heart and one soul at a time. You start with yourself, answering the call to holiness. One thing is for sure. We need the mercy of God. Hmm? In the timeless teaching of our Catholic faith, we refer to the church on earth as the church militant, which we define as a church of souls still struggling with sin and temptation and therefore engaged in warfare, spiritual warfare, with the world, the flesh, and the devil. We are called to be the church militant, not the church mush. Hmm? The church militant, not the church fearful, not the church intimidated, not the church ashamed, not the church punching bag, not the church lukewarm. As I travel around the country preaching missions and retreats, I'd have to say, the most frequent complaint we get from lay people is that they are sick and tired of lukewarm, watered-down Catholicism. They have had enough of Catholicism light. They want the real deal. Catholicism light is not like Miller light. Remember the old beer commercials? Tastes great, less filling. Catholicism light is less filling, but it doesn't taste great. It's sickening. It's nauseating. We're called to be the church militant, but are we really? <laughs> Have we now backed off from all that for the sake of political correctness? There's been some suggestion in recent years that we now accept the title of the church militant in theory, but not in practice. That baptized Christians need not be soldiers for Christ anymore, but merely Nice guys, nice gals. Right? This is the prevailing mentality of our day. People have got the idea that being nice, niceness is the summation of all Christian virtue. Fellas, are you aware of the fact that word nice is nowhere to be found in sacred scripture? 
in either its Hebrew or Greek derivative. We're not called to be nice. We're called to be holy. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. What happens if the salt loses its savor? It's good for nothing but to be thrown down and trampled underfoot. That is what I believe is happening. We're letting it happen. Brothers, whether you like it or not, whether you want to hear it or not, we are at war. The battle is real. The battle is here. And it is now. And our battle is not just with the forces of terrorism. Our battle is with the leader, the founder, the author of all terror, and that is Satan. And the losses in this war have already been horrendous, staggering. And I tell you, the spiritual casualties in this war will be lost forever. Why do I say that? Because the worst thing that can happen in the order of God's creation is the loss of souls. It's mortal sin. A while back, I was having a conversation with one of the more senior Benedictine monks in the country. He was in his 90s. We got to talking about our respective apostolates, And our apostolates, of course, could not be more opposite in regard to the active and the contemplative. But this elderly monk asked me uh, what I found the hardest thing to deal with in my life as an itinerant preacher. And I answered without any hesitation that it is the cold indifference that I find on so many Catholics that I meet. You know, the church is full of all kinds of people, bright, gifted, talented men, many of them accomplished professionals who have risen to the top of their respective fields, guys who have gone on for years, maybe even for a lifetime. They will push themselves, drive themselves, knock themselves out, make any sacrifice to get ahead in the world. For what? For what? Small profit, a small promotion, small advantage over a rival or a competitor in business or professional life. But for God, they do nothing. To defend the faith, they do nothing. To build up the body of Christ, they do nothing. The salvation of their souls, they think nothing. Their bank accounts, their portfolios are fat, but they are spiritually bankrupt. God have mercy on them. I fear many will become the spiritual casualties in the battle of our time. We need the mercy of God. The spiritual life is a constant, lifelong, daily struggle. Within every human soul, there is a battle that goes on, a battle between good and evil, light and darkness, virtue and vice. All of us feel the attractive power of sin at work in our lives. Our Lord said, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. And in this spiritual battle, fellows, remember, the toughest opponent you'll ever have to overcome is the one you see in the mirror every morning. Watch out for that guy. Watch out for that bum. Without the grace of God, without the divine assistance, believe me when I tell you, that guy is more dangerous to you than the Russians and the North Koreans and Vladimir Putin, and Kim Jong-un, and ISIS, and Al-Qaeda, and the Taliban, Boko Haram, and all the terrorists put together. St. Philip Neri used to make his morning offering and say, Lord, beware of Philip. Watch out for Philip today. He could betray you. (laughs) Uh, If we don't stay close to our blessed Lord, we're going to fall. When we expose the Blessed Sacrament on the altar for adoration, we always sing the traditional exposition hymn, O Saving Victim, O Solitaris Hostia. And uh, when we sing that hymn, we come to the Latin verse with the words, Bela premont hostilia. Bela premont hostilia. Our foes press on from every side. Isn't it true in the spiritual life? Our foes press on from every side. The real enemies of the soul. Sin, temptation, pride, self-will, lust, impurity, 
pornography, anger, lack of forgiveness, bitterness, resentment, broken relationships, family breakup, stress, anxiety, discouragement, depression, loneliness, addiction, loss of faith, etc. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. Without the grace of God, it is impossible to escape the bondage of sinful habits. And in the American pop culture we live in, we are truly in a spiritual minefield, a spiritually poisonous, toxic environment. We live in a culture where we are constantly bombarded with temptation, especially the temptations against purity, the movies, the television, the internet. Pornography is everywhere, the immodesty in dress. We're living in a sex-saturated culture. And for that reason, fellas, it really takes a heroic effort to be able to put Christian virtue into practice, especially the virtue of chastity. The key word here is heroic, a heroic effort. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. And we know in order for us to remain in the state of grace, we have got to have recourse to all the means of grace and bring all the most powerful spiritual weapons to bear. Prayer. Prayer. St. Therese of Lisieux said, my whole strength lies in prayer. Prayer is an invincible weapon. Prayer moves hearts far better than words ever can. The power of prayer, especially Eucharistic adoration, Mother Teresa of Calcutta used to say, the time you spend with Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament will be the best, the most profitable time you will ever spend here on earth. Pope St. John Paul II used to say, make the Holy Eucharist the source of your strength. Another weapon in our battle. The inspired word of God in the sacred scriptures, spiritual reading and meditation. The saints have taught us through the ages it is impossible to grow in the spiritual life without the practice of spiritual reading and meditation. Third, the third great weapon, the sacraments, worthy reception of the sacraments, especially Holy Communion, frequent confession. Frequent confession is your spiritual big bomb, big gun in the battle of our time. I know an old priest, been a priest for more than 60 years, and I remember him telling me one time, I have never known the man who had to struggle with some sin within himself who could not overcome it by means of frequent confession. Frequent confession, it's like you're swinging a sledgehammer down on sin and temptation. Hmm? You may hit that concrete block a hundred times. Nothing seems to happen, but one time you're going to bring that hammer down, the whole thing is going to shatter. Frequent confession, and finally, avoiding the occasions of sin. You can try to deceive yourself. You can try to find your fulfillment in sinful relationships and sinful lifestyles. Uh, you can adopt the playboy mentality. You can adopt the rotten, insidious, contraceptive mentality. You can surrender your body, which God intends to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, to the pagan mores of the sexual revolution, the subculture of pornography, fornication, adultery, homosexual activity. Sodomy, self-abuse, and degradation. You can have the kind of false, fleeting peace and joy somebody like you Hefner had walking around in his bathrobe for 70 years. God have mercy on him. And I guess you know that uh, you Hefner passed away about three weeks ago. In case there's anybody who doesn't know who you Hefner was, He was the founder of Playboy magazine and is considered to be the godfather of modern pornography. And I was thinking about this upon the news of his death. 
Did any man ever lead so many other men into sin? I wonder. Hugh Hefner was a committed atheist all his life long. He used to say, and I quote, It has always been perfectly clear to me that religion is a myth. And he lived like he believed it. He used to say, there is no heaven, there is no hell, there's no afterlife. There are no rewards. There are no punishments in the next life. It is only here and now. So live it up. Get all the pleasure that you can any way that you can. In his old age, Hugh Hefner boasted that he had had sex with more than a thousand women. Yet among them all, he said, he could never find his soulmate. Is it any wonder he could never find his soulmate? He could never see past a woman's body long enough to even know she had a soul. We have a name for that. We call it lust. Now, I'm not passing judgment on him, right? May God have mercy on his soul. We should pray for the repose of his soul. But I couldn't help but think that in my lifetime, I had known so many guys who would fantasize about living the kind of life that you Hefner did, like he had it all, right? He had all the pleasure, all the sex, all the money, all the wealth, all the fame, Where did it get him? Where is he now? Hmm? Our Lord said, What would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? No. You can't find your fulfillment in sinful lifestyles. Poor, fallen human nature remains. The internal, addictive, compulsive dynamics of sin will be operative in your life. You see, fellas... Within every human soul, there is truly a dark side. And that dark side, left to itself, unchecked by grace and virtue, will conquer. When it does, the human person can be transformed into the level of an animal, spiritually speaking. Sometimes even a monster. For example, surrender to lust. Impurity in thought and in action leads to sexual addiction, obsession, and finally, perversion. That is why pornography has now become, spiritually speaking, America's most deadly addiction. It is the devil's most deadly trap. I call addiction to internet porn the methamphetamine of the soul. It is so powerful and often so instant, instantaneously addictive. I have a friend, a priest friend, who's a canon lawyer, and he works in the diocesan marriage tribunal, and I remember that he came home from work uh, at the end of a particularly rotten day, an exasperating day, depressed. And over dinner, he was telling his brother priest, about his day, and I remember him saying to us, you would not believe how many marriages are being broken up by addiction to internet pornography. That should make sense to you, fellas. You see, a guy who gets hooked on porn very often loses interest in his own wife, and he'll begin to find other ways to satisfy himself. You see, his wife, his poor wife, can't compete with those women in the videos. Those women are always beautiful. Those women never get sick. Those women never get old. Those women don't argue. Those women don't need money. Those women are always available to gratify his desires. It is a rotten, insidious form of adultery. It's poison. The poison of the soul. Greed, avarice, Leaves the soul always wanting more, more, and more. The greedy person is never satisfied. 
Enough is never enough, precisely because material goods and money cannot satisfy the deepest longings of the human spirit. The alcoholic is never satiated. He's got to battle the addiction. For the alcoholic, there's the old saying, one drink is too many, a thousand are not enough. The drug abuser gets hooked, and the high always wears off, and there's got to be more and more bigger doses, more potent junk to get the same kind of high. The end is addiction, destruction of the person in mind and body, and very often the ruin of the people who are closest to him, the people that he loves. Jesus said, those who live in sin become the slaves of sin. This is the bondage of the human will, the surrender to the soul of vice. Now listen, many people try to deceive themselves by claiming in living some of the most immoral lifestyles, that they are merely following their own consciences. What they are really following are their own desires, their own lustful passions. You are aware of the fact, I hope, that each one of us, every one of us has an obligation, a serious moral obligation before God to have a correct conscience a rightly formed conscience, a conscience that is formed in accordance with God's eternal moral law, God's definitive revelation to humanity, the teaching of the church. The apostle St. Peter said, live as free men, but don't use your freedom as a cover for vice. You see, there are two kinds of peace. There's true peace, there's false peace. The false peace people make for themselves to surrender to vice, compromise with the world and the flesh and the devil, and there is the true, lasting peace that is the gift of God. Here's the key point. The source of our peace is the sure knowledge that God loves us. Let me say that again for you. The source of our peace is the sure knowledge that God loves us. God loves you and God's love will never fail you. God made you and God did not bring you into this world to abandon you. And if you think that he would, it can only be because you don't know him. If you've got it, God forbid, get over the idea that your sins are bigger than the mercy of God who sent his only begotten son to die for you. I remember one time, uh, Mother Angelica told us, You know, if you were the only sinner in the world, if you were the only soul in this world in need of redemption, God would still have become man. Jesus Christ would still have come into this world to die for you, for you alone. That is the infinite value of a single soul in the sight of Almighty God. Now, you know, God offers the gift of his mercy. we got to cooperate with that grace. Hmm? I think that whenever we talk about the mercy of God, we also need to talk about two really, really bad responses to it. The two worst responses to the divine mercy. Two opposite extremes. Sins against the virtue of hope. The first, the most rampant today, is presumption. Presumption, the idea that God is so loving and so merciful that it doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't matter what I believe. Doesn't matter how I live. I think God is going to forgive me anyway, and I can commit as many sins as I want to. I don't have to change. I'm going to heaven anyway. There it is, the big lie, the devil's trap. Hmm? One time... A very proud man went to Padre Pio, St. Pio Piacocina. He told Padre Pio he wasn't going to confession anymore because he didn't believe in hell anymore. And Padre Pio looked at him, glared at him with those piercing eyes that he had. He said to him, you'll believe it when you get there. Hmm? Now, the other extreme, the other sin against the virtue of hope, despair. 
to spare the idea that my sins are too big and too bad and too many for God to forgive. It is that seductive little voice that tries to get into your head uh, telling you God doesn't really love you. God is never going to forgive you. You've gone too far. It's too late for you. There's no turning back now. Why don't you just give it up? It's no use. It's too late for you. There's no hope for you. No hope for you. No hope for you. You know, that is talking. That's the devil talking, right? I've heard despair called the capital city of hell. You know, I have known many good Catholics who have somehow gotten the idea that God is kind of like the divine traffic cop out there just waiting to catch you in the act. Right? It's like God is the divine state trooper hiding on the other side of the little hill with his radar gun, waiting to catch you, breaking the law so he can pounce on you and say, gotcha, now you're in mortal sin. Now you're going to hell. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, that's not God's will for anybody. Right? Now make no mistake, nothing has changed. If you die unrepentant, if you die in a state of mortal sin, you will go to hell. You got to take God at his word. Don't mess with God. Don't play fast and loose with the salvation of your soul because you could lose it. But that's not God's will for anybody. God is that loving, merciful father of the gospel who waited with open arms for the prodigal son to come home and said, Rejoice with me. This son of mine was dead. Now he's alive again. Remember the parable of the prodigal son? The father said, The son of mine was dead. Now he's alive again. Why did the father say that? prodigal son wasn't dead. He wasn't physically dead. He was spiritually dead, dead in mortal sin. And the divine mercy brought him back to life again. And fellas, what is the most beautiful and the most powerful experience of the divine mercy? It is the sacrament of penance, confession. Confession spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, positively, the best source of peace there is in the whole world. Say what you will. And the beautiful thing about confession is that whenever you confess your sins to the best of your ability and the best of your memory, you haven't held anything back deliberately and you're truly sorry for all your sins and you've got that firm purpose of amendment, which means that you're going to try with the help of God's grace to avoid the same sins in the future. You know, you leave that confession with that confident assurance of God's complete forgiveness. That is something that will fill you with a sense of relief. It will be a burden lifted off of your shoulders. And it comes sometimes so often with the joy, the spirit of joy that comes with having a clear conscience before God. And I would not trade that for anything in this world. I, I think back in my own life. I think about how many times I've gone to confession in my lifetime. And I think it is true to say that our Lord has literally forgiven me 70 times 70. Right? 70 times 7. <laughs> what a beautiful thing. You see, confession will make a new man out of you. Because that sacramental confession is a personal meeting, a personal encounter with the living Lord Jesus Christ. The incomparable power of that 5, 10, 15 minute sacramental meeting with Christ can change hearts and lives forever. I have seen it many times over the years. Pope St. John Paul II, in a homily that he gave early on in his pontificate, said this, quote, Those confessionals scattered about the world where men declare their sins don't speak of the severity of God, they speak of his mercy. And all those who approach the confessional sometimes after many years weighed down with mortal sins in the moment of getting rid of this terrible burden find at last a longed for relief. They find joy and tranquility of conscience which outside confession they will never be able to find anywhere. I came across a great quotation from Pope St. John Paul II. Um, 
taken from a speech that he had given in one of his visits to the United States. He said this, visiting the city of Philadelphia, my hometown. Quote, We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not think the wide circle of the American society or the wide circle of the Christian community realize this. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. This confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. We must prepare ourselves to suffer great trials before long. With your and my prayers, it is possible to mitigate the coming tribulation, but it is no longer possible to avert it, because only thus can the church be effectively renewed. How many times has the renewal of the church sprung from the shedding of blood? This time, too, it will not be otherwise. We must be strong and prepared and trust in Christ and in his Holy Mother and be very, very assiduous in praying the rosary. Now, I heard this story recently. And this is a true story. Hmm? There was a great article about this in the National Catholic Register. Bishop Oliver Dasha Doma of Nigeria is bishop of that part of northeastern Nigeria where thousands of Christians have been attacked and butchered for their faith by the brutal, savage terrorist group called Boko Haram. Bishop Doma has seen 6,000 members of his flock murdered, hundreds of young Christian women kidnapped and sold into slavery. Ten years ago, there were 125,000 Catholics in his diocese. Today, less than 60,000. Most have had to flee for their lives, flee their homes. One night, Bishop Doma was praying in a Eucharistic Adoration Chapel when he had a vision. Our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him. And our Lord said nothing at first. But then our Lord held out his nail-pierced hands. He extended his hands to the bishop. And in our Lord's hands, there was a sword, a large, fearsome-looking sword. As Bishop Doma took the sword from our Lord's hands, Jesus said to him, Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. And as our Lord vanished from the bishop's sight, the sword he had placed in his hands turned into the Holy Rosary. Then Bishop Doma knew he had gotten his marching orders. Then he began the task of organizing a nationwide rosary crusade. Two years later, two years into that rosary crusade, Boko Haram has finally been driven from that country. And most of the girls kidnapped, they have already gotten back. What I'm saying, brothers, is it can be done. It can be done. Think about this. The enemies of the church have got all the worldly power on their side. They have got the governments. They got the money. They got the news and entertainment media. They got the celebrities. They got the movies. They got the television. They got the internet. They control all the means of social communication. They've got the courts. They got the public schools. They got the universities. With them, an army of Marxist professors. What do we got? What do we got? All we have is God. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Hmm? St. Teresa of Avila used to say, God is a majority of one. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. He said, if you live in me and my words stay a part of you, you may ask what you will and it will be done for you. 
Brothers, before I close, let me say this to you. By all external appearances, it may seem like the battle is already lost, like the people of God are hopelessly outnumbered and all the cards are stacked against us. But I remind you, the final outcome is never in doubt for men and women of faith. Jesus Christ is the ultimate victor in all this, and his message is always the same. Be not afraid. Pray always and never lose heart. St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, in his commentary on the virtue of fortitude, taught us that it is far more virtuous, far more meritorious in the sight of Almighty God to hold out in the face of a hopeless situation, to persevere in the face of great opposition and overwhelming odds and great suffering than it is to spread the faith with great ease and success. St. Teresa of Calcutta used to say, God does not call us to be successful, only faithful. St. Teresa of Avila said this about prayer. I want you to remember this and don't ever forget it. As we reflect on the spiritual battle of our time, she said, God plus one is an army. God bless you.